Okay, this is mid-2017, and we're going to talk about the autonomic outflow of the spinal cord. And in the fall, late fall of 2016, the landscape changed. We learned that the, we learned something more about the autonomic outflow, in particular about the autonomic outflow from the sacral cord. What we learned is that that outflow should be considered is not different from the sympathetic outflow from the thoracic cord. It is different from the parasympathetic outflow from the hindbrain. So from around 1870s, from the time of Gaskell up to the 2016, uh, the sacral autonomics were considered parasympathetic, and that led to the use of the term craniosacral. In 2016, we learned that these uh, sacral autonomics resemble in all ways the thoracic autonomics and do not resemble at all the hindbrain autonomics, and so they should be considered sympathetic. This makes the term craniosacral no longer uh, useful. The bottom line is that all of the spinal cord outflow is sympathetic. Here is, is the paper. It was published in Science uh, from Jean-Francois Brunet's lab, which I had the honor of, of visiting last year. Uh, this is a really exciting result. It should give us a lot of insight into the molecular uh, vulnerabilities and capabilities of these neurons. It still it doesn't change who those neurons are. It doesn't. It's not going to change the clinical um, presentations of those. It is going to change our language, but I cannot tell you when that language is going to change in the clinical literature or in the clinical environment. So my suspicion is that for quite a few more years, clinicians will continue to use the word craniosacral, will continue to think of the sacral autonomics as parasympathetic. They are not. Um, uh, and I won't, I won't teach it that way because it's wrong. But for, for a while yet, I think both clinicians and perhaps um, clinical tests such as step one are going to probably use this older terminology. So please understand that for right now, the best bet is for you to understand, but have a foot in both worlds. Um, uh, and we're going to go ahead and, and, and look, at these, um, look at these pathways. OK, so really exciting from my point of view. Uh, um, and you just simply are, are right there at the cusp, so you have to learn both terminologies. OK, so the outflow from the sympathetics uh, it starts around C8, T1, and continues back into the sacral cord. And it's topographic, as I mentioned before, where the, the, the most rostral segments are serving the eye, the face, the head, and then the upper viscera, then the, the lower viscera, and finally the pelvic floor viscera, pelvic floor organs. Now, all autonomic outflow takes a two-step process. And this is in stark contrast to how we get from the central nervous system to a skeletal muscle. So autonomic targets are smooth muscle, glands, and cardiac muscle. Some skeletal motor or, or voluntary motor target is skeletal muscle, so different from this. And to get to these autonomic tar targets, it takes two cells. It takes an autonomic preganglionic neuron in the central nervous system, and then an autonomic ganglionic neuron in the post, I'm sorry, in the um, periphery, periphery. So this neuron is typically called a preganglionic. It comes before the ganglion. And this neuron is called a postganglionic because this fiber is, is after the ganglion. So this is the postganglionic neuron, also the ganglionic neuron, but we'll call it the postganglionic neuron. And this is the preganglionic neuron. To get to the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands, you have to go through this two-step dance. To get to skeletal muscle, it's a straight shot. So the, the reality is that we have no voluntary control over these uh, over activating this. You cannot, for example, turn on sweating 
more to the point, you can't turn off sweating. Okay, it happens or it doesn't happen. You got no control. Whereas with skeletal muscle, with uh, only a couple of exceptions, you have control over whether you contract those muscles. Okay. So let's take an example of a, an autonomic pathway. And the example that we're gonna look at is, is the oculosympathetic system. And the oculosympathetic system, it starts in the hypothalamus and it projects, there's a, a, a neuron in the hypothalamus that projects down and comes down into the thoracic cord to end on uh, preganglionic neurons in the thoracic cord that then send their axons up to the superior cervical ganglion, one of the autonomic ganglia. It's high up, so it, it's, it's, the most, it's the most rostral ganglion. And from there uh, to a few targets uh, in the face. So the targets are the superior tarsal muscle, which is a muscle in the eyelid that is, that is involuntary. You have actually two muscles in your top eyelid, okay? One is voluntary. I can, I can look up, I can look down, I can move that. The other one is involuntary. When does it, when does it open and shut? Well, when you wake up, it opens. And when you fall asleep, when you're falling asleep during a lecture, what happens? Your eyes close. Your eyelids go down. That's the superior tarsal muscle. It's, it is automatically controlled in concert with waking and, and sleeping. You're not controlling it. It is being controlled. So that's the superior tarsal muscle. There is also uh, innervation from this pathway of the pupillary dilator. So in a sympath the sympathetic effect is to dilate the, um, the pupil. Uh, and the effect, uh, um, and so, so that, that is another one of the um, functions that is controlled by this oculosympathetic pathway. And finally, the same, the same neurons will also, uh, the same preganglionics will also innervate different postganglionics that go to the face that go to both the blood vessels, the smooth muscle surrounding a blood vessel, and, and um, relax, either constrict or relax that, uh, uh, the walls of that blood vessel, and also to the sweat glands and activate sweating. So if you cut this uh, pathway, what you would see is that the, the autonomic the automatic uh, control of the eyelid would be impaired. And so instead of being wide open, the eye would be a little bit closed, be a little bit droopy. And a droopy eyelid is called ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S. -S. Um, and the pupillary dil dilator um, would, would not be dilating. So you'd have, instead of a, a, a pupil that's halfway between dilated and constricted, you'd have a really constricted pupil a really pinpoint pupil, and that's called meiosis, M-I-O-I-S-I-S. -I -I um, and, uh, and then in addition, you would not be able to constrict your, uh, the blood vessels of the face, and so your, blood, your face would be flushed, um, and you would not be uh, able to, to sweat, and so you would have what's called anhydrosis, no sweating, no sweating on the, on the, on the face. This collection of um, symptoms is known as Horner syndrome. And what's interesting and what's important about Horner syndrome, and Horner syndrome is typically always on step one exams, and it's sort of one of those things you, you really should know, it's high yield neurology. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is, you know, Doc, I, I, I have a spinal cord injury or I, I hit my back or, or something, something's wrong. Why are you looking at my eyes? Well, you're looking at the eyes because the spinal cord also controls the, the face, the eyes. So this is a way in which a spinal cord injury can, um, this is a way in which a spinal cord injury can, can affect the face and the eye. So some pla a place is very remote, not body. 
All right. Um, there are a number of places where this uh, lesion can occur that can produce the Horner syndrome. You should work through these on your own um, or in small groups. Uh, it's, it's very revealing. Th this is one of the autonomic pathways that involves the spinal cord. There are others, and, and most notably, there's, there's one other, which is that the, there is um, the region in S2 to S4, which uh, innervates the bladder, allows a person to void, okay? So if there's an interruption here, in, either centrally or peripherally, of the autonomics going out to the eye and face, you get Horner syndrome, if there's an interruption down here in sacral cord, one of the reasons might be cardioquina syndrome. Um, uh, there are other reasons. Um, what happens is that you, you lose the coordinated uh, control over the bladder, a smooth muscle, and the external urethral sphincter, a skeletal muscle. So in order to avoid, what you need is coordinated contraction of the bladder, which is automatically done, and relaxation of the external urethral sphincter, which is voluntarily done in adults. If those two can't be coordinated, and a common reason, a incredibly common reason, are spinal cord injury patients, virtually all of them are candidates to have this problem because S2 to S4 is so uh, far down in the spinal cord. So any lesion above that has the potential to interrupt the fibers that come from the brain to S2 and S4. If that, if that connection from the brain that says, relax the external urethral sphincter, if that is interrupted, then the ure external urethral sphincter remains contracted, the bladder contracts, and now you've got the bladder contracting and it can't, and the urine can't leave. That's a problem. That's called bladder uh, sphincter disinter dysenergia, um, and that has to be treated. It has to be uh, fixed um, surgically or, um, uh, or, or by some method. Um, so this is a very common problem for people with spinal cord injuries. Okay, in the next uh, video, we're gonna move inside the spinal gray. <laughs>